Good morning. Please be seated. Well, we can tell that things are different in here. At long last, ordinary time is over. 20 some odd weeks of, uh, of green in here has been replaced by the, the blue and the garlands of Advent. Finally. Not only in our church, though, but all over town, I've been seeing lights and trees and Christmas decorations popping up. Cozy Christmas nostalgia is in full bloom. I've actually been noticing some Christmas creep going on the last few years. People aren't waiting until after Thanksgiving anymore to put up all of their Christmas stuff. Our neighbors uh, actually had all of their, their Christmas stuff up promptly the day after Halloween. <laughs> And the retail stores have got their stuff out even earlier than that, it seems. Don't get me wrong, I love this season, and it carries for me some of my fondest childhood memories. Memories of spending time with my family and decorating our house, being wrapped up in blankets with hot cocoa and Christmas cookies by the fire, listening to some of our favorite Christmas music and wrapping presents, even setting up the nativity scene with the baby Jesus in the manger. But today's readings are determined to throw a big wet blanket on all of that cozy Christmas nostalgia. Right here at the beginning of the church year, we're hearing Jesus tell us about the end of the world. The doctrine that Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead is probably one of the most unpopular and inconvenient of all the church's teachings. Maybe that's why we're trying to get it over with in the first of the, first of the year. But there are apparently three things our Lord wanted us to get out of this teaching, and they must have been important, because it's far from the only time he speaks about them in the gospel. The first is that Jesus is certainly coming back. We cannot know when. Therefore, we must keep awake. Jesus' first point, I'm coming back, y'all. I'm coming back. We can take Jesus at his word here. He was taking his whole reputation on this promise to return. And to make it perfectly clear that he meant it, he repeated this promise to his disciples even after his resurrection from the dead. There are over 300 allusions to the second coming of Christ in the New Testament, many of which come from our Lord's own lips. Either Jesus really meant this one, or else he didn't mean anything he said. But this time he assures us it would not be in humility as a babe in a manger, but in great glory and majesty as a king and judge over the world that he created. Jesus' second point, you cannot possibly know when it's going to happen, so don't try to guess. Jesus is coming back, but just like in the days of Noah, things will be perfectly normal until it happens. For as in those days, Jesus said, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. At that time, only one man was listening to God, who was shouting all the while, Build a boat. The floods are coming. In this passage, Jesus rather unflatteringly compares himself to a thief in the night. He's saying, Hey guys, I'm so sneaky, even I don't know when I'm coming back. So you can't either. Regardless of Christ's warning, however, people have been engaged in that sport of idle spectation about when he's going to be coming back, even since the very beginning of Christian history. If we look to the beginning of the book of Acts, day one of the Christian church, Jesus is there with all of his disciples in his risen glory. And his disciples ask him, Lord, 
is this the time when you restore the kingdom to Israel? That is, uh, so now are you going to take over Caesar's throne and rule over the nations and, uh, you know, rescue us from our oppressors? What does Jesus say? It is not for you to know the time the Father has set. Translation, that's none of your business. But you will receive power from the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Keep your mind on the mission. Then Jesus ascended, and there the apostles stood, waiting, looking up into heaven, where out from heaven come two angels who say to them, Hey, uh, what are you all looking at? You, you heard the man. Get on with it. Do what he told you. Every generation since, Christians have caved into the temptation to guess and speculate about the date of his return rather than devoting themselves wholeheartedly to obeying his commandments. I expect that when the Lord returns, he'll have this question for each of us at St. Philip's. Have you done everything within your power to grow faith, both in yourself and others, that impacts the world in my name? Does anybody here remember that show that used to be on the air, uh, Chef Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares? I love that show. I love that show. Every episode goes basically the same, but somehow it never manages, it, it always manages to surprise me. A restaurant owner calls up Chef Ramsay in total desperation. His restaurant, his business is falling apart. Well, Chef Ramsay, can you take a look around and, and see if you can't do anything to save my business? Um, so, Chef Ramsay does. He comes by. And even though they've had plenty of time to prepare themselves for his arrival, to get things uh, together and into order, what does he discover? but all manner of creeping horrors dwelling and multiplying in the freezers and the pantries in every shadowy corner of the restaurants. Just imagine if Chef Ramsay were to drop by one of his own restaurant chains and find it in such a state of disrepair, ignoring all of his instructions. But will the church be in any better shape when our Lord comes back and calls us to task for how we've been managing his gifts and his resources? Now, I don't want you to think about God like an angry, angry micromanaging boss looking for the first opportunity to catch us slacking off or enjoying ourselves on the job. He's not Chef Ramsay. What he is is a God who is jealous for those people he died to save whom he has left the church responsible for until he comes back. And that leads us to Jesus' third point. Therefore, keep awake. We must be ready for his return. Even good Christians can occasionally drift off and sleepwalk through their spiritual lives, forgetting who they are and whose they are and what their true purpose is in this world. It's understandable. I'm certainly guilty of this. But in the words of the poet John Donne, what if this present were the world's last night? Suppose Jesus came back today. So what's the deal with Jesus drawing our attention to this? Is he trying to frighten us? I thought Jesus was the one always telling his disciples to be not afraid. Well, fear isn't always a bad thing. The Bible tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Anxiety is my brain's way of saying, hey, pay attention and stop messing around. This situation is important and I might not know everything that I need to know to be successful. And my survival could be at stake here. When I first learned to drive, it was like that pretty much all the time. 
Maybe we've got some new drivers here who know what I'm talking about. A healthy respect for the dangers of the road was the necessary, though uncomfortable, beginning of my career as a competent driver. Well, that, uh, that fear eventually, that anxiety is eventually replaced by confidence. But a little bit of fear at the right time is healthy for us. I suppose when the snowfall begins in Dallas, it might be sheer terror all over again. The right amount of fear at the right time is healthy, but it doesn't make a good staple food for our spiritual diets. That fear has to be balanced by hope. Hope is like when you're strapped for cash and struggling with the bills, and your life is in shambles, it's falling apart. But then you hear that you've won the lottery, and a hundred million dollar check is on its way to you in the mail right now. You don't have that cash in hand just yet, but you know it's coming. Well, your outlook on life would change real fast, wouldn't it? Well, the best thing that we can possibly have in this life or the next is union with God. And that is precisely what we do have through the sufferings of Jesus Christ on our behalf. My friends, we have won the lottery of lotteries. The whole inheritance of the king of the universe is ours in Christ. Even Christ's own perfect righteousness. But we may have to wait patiently for the full installment. You see, it's not despair, but healthy fear. It's not presumption, but expectant hope. That's how the Christian stands in this present age until our Lord returns. So how do we keep awake? How can we be on our toes and ready for our Lord's return? Here's what St. Paul says in our reading from the letter to the Romans. You know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. St. Paul is thinking about the world as split into two distinct ages. We are still living in the age of darkness. Corruption, selfishness, lies, and deceit are its common currency. The inheritance and the curse of our ancestor Adam's first sin. But a new age of light has begun through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's still night, but sunrise is right around the corner. That is, the age when Christ returns in glory to rule over his people with justice and peace. That age is 2,000 years closer to us today than it was for St. Paul. King Jesus is coming back, so we have to start living now as if it were already the daytime of his glorious reign. This means two things for us. The first is what St. Paul says, casting off or laying aside the works of darkness. That is, a this-worldly lifestyle. The things that St. Paul names here are the basics. Things like a lack of self-control in food and drink, too much love of worldly pleasures and comforts, using our speech to tear others down rather than build them up. But you could go on filling in the blanks for yourself. It's all of those old, vicious habits that are no longer fitting for a friend of God. For Christians to live like this is like continuously hitting the snooze button on your alarm clock, especially when you have a test coming up later that day or a big presentation to give at work. It's just not wise. But it's so easy to just hit snooze one more time. It's the default setting of this world. It's that mindset that says, it's my life, it's all about my plans and what I want. 
But as Christians, we are to cast off this mindset. And we are to put on the armor of light, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice that St. Paul doesn't say here, work hard to be a good person. What does he say? Put on the Lord Jesus. Put on. It's because it is through his work and not ours that we're able to walk in the light, to live a righteous and holy and godly life. If I'm putting on the Lord Jesus, that means I'm going to totally cover myself with his lordship, with his dominion, with his authority and his rule. If Jesus is my Lord and King, I will surrender my right to direct my own life in my own way and let him take dominion over every part and aspect of my life. My finances, my thought life, my work life, my family life, I turn it all over. I surrender my agendas to him and let his spirit shape my thoughts and my heart, my desires and commitments from now on. As a child of God, I'm going to wear the family uniform. Now, everything is an awful lot to ask. But St. Paul is begging us here to seize the grace that is so freely offered and available to us, to transform our hearts and minds. Jesus died for us not only to forgive us our sins, but to break the hold of sinful thoughts, desires, and patterns on our lives altogether, and to give us his own mind and power and spirit. It is God's promise, his guarantee to the one who perseveres in asking for that grace and who in courage takes the first tiniest millimeters of a step to put on that armor of light. What if this present were the world's last night or yours? Suppose tonight were the night that Jesus came back for you or all of us together. I imagine you would have this question for us. Did you use the gifts I gave you to build up my church, to witness to my love, and to bless those in need any chance you had? For now, there is still time to wake from slumber. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in Jesus Christ we have won the lottery of lotteries. We rejoice in all of his gifts toward us. We pray that you would stir us up in that deep part of our spirits, that we might cast off the works of darkness in our lives, whatever they might be, and that we might rise with joy when your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, appears to rule in glory. We wait eagerly for that day, Lord. Thank you. Amen.